first order of business is to take the roll. Ms. Niedernhofer. Liebling. Present. Hewitt. Present. Schumacher. Schumacher, present. Eklund. Present. Becker. Excused. Bonner. Present. Bierman. Present. Bolden. Present. Damon. Present. Freiburg. Freiburg. Grunhagen. Present. Keel. Keel. Morrison. Morrison. Munson. Present. Pryor. Present. Quam. Quam. Ryer. Present. Schultz. Present. Wolgamot. Wolgamot, present. A quorum is present. All right, thank you very much, Ms. Niedernhofer. And um, so members, of course, this is an additional hearing. So um, hopefully we'll get some of the members who didn't respond are, are gonna be joining us shortly since this is not one of our regularly scheduled meetings. But the next order of business is uh, for approval of the minutes of March 10th. Um, is there a motion to approve the minutes? Madam Chair, I will move the minutes from March 10th. Thank you, Representative Bonner. So Representative Bonner moves approval of the minutes of March 10th. Is there any discussion to the minutes? Seeing none, if members would just unmute briefly. All in favor of approval of the minutes, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion prevails, the minutes are approved, thank you. So uh, the first bill on our agenda is House File 970, the first engrossment. <clears throat> and so, um, Representative Vang is here to explain her bill, and because she's not on the committee, the chair will move that House File 970, the first engrossment, be laid over for possible inclusion in the finance bill. Welcome, Representative Vang. Um, and I know Representative Vang has an author's amendment, and would you prefer to move that right away and adopt it and then explain the bill as amended, or would you rather explain the amendment first? Uh, yes, please, Madam Chair. I can explain the amendment first, and then we can uh, move and adopt adopt it. The, the All A right, very well. So let me just move it. So the chair will move the um, A7 amendment to get the bill in the order in which the author would like to discuss it. Please explain the amendment. Thank you, um, Madam Chair and members of the committee. So the author's A7 amendment uh, is a result of addressing many of the board's concerns to ensure that this work is feasible and implementable to them. Uh, some of the changes are also advised by staff to be consistent with statutory language. Um, it, it may seem a lot, but it's, it's, uh, a lot of it is technical um, and to uh, and agreements made uh, in, in conjunction with boards. All right, thank you. So with that, I will vote on adopting the A7 author's amendment. If you would unmute members, all in favor of adoption of the A7, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. All right, Representative Vang, if you would please explain your bill as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just wanna say that this bill could not have come at a more uh, important time. Uh, it is no secret that we have a dire mental health workforce shortage that needs to be addressed, especially in light of the increased needs of, of the pandemic. For a long time, poor access to mental health care include uh, rural communities where individuals are less likely to have a mental health treatment facility than metro counties. Communities of color are less likely to get the treatment they need, and low-income communities are less likely to have uh, the mental health treatment resources than high-income communities. Uh, this bill brings comprehensive support and addresses a number of things that my testifier can go through the bill to elaborate on each section. I think what's important to highlight is the amount of work that has been put into this bill to address this workforce shortage. This has been a result of coalitions and advocates working across the state to create these recommendations that now shape this bill. In 2013, the legislature passed a bill requiring the Minnesota State Colleges and Universities, Minsky, to convene a task force 
to develop a comprehensive plan to increase the number of qualified people working at all levels of our mental health system, ensure appropriate coursework and training, and to create a more culturally diverse mental health workforce. Meetings were held across the state, surveys were conducted, and a large summit was held. Since then, some but not all of the recommendations have been implemented, and several key measures remain. These include ensuring access to and affordability of supervisory hours, requiring all third-party payers and commercial insurers to reimburse in the same way that medical assistance does for supervision and internships, um, and create training programs with stipends, scholarships, and pathways to licensure targeted at students from diverse communities. And finally, improve and expand uh, cultural competency awareness training. The Wilder Foundation and the Mental Health Improvement Work Group, co-led by NAMI Minnesota and the Department of Human Ser Services, also played a role in shaping this bill. Uh, and with that, Madam Chair, I'm happy to have my testifiers proceed on the importance of this bill. All right, thank you very much, Representative Vang. Um, Ms. Abderholden, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. Sue Abderholden, Executive Director of NAMI Minnesota. And I was just going to quickly walk you through the sections of the bill um, because it's, it is rather large. Um, section one just requires private insurance to pay for the care and treatment provided by clinical trainees. Um, Medicaid and Minnesota Care and several private health plans already do, and this would just kind of create that equity across the board. Um, we do pay for other types of clinical trainees, and if we don't pay for them, it makes it hard for someone to actually find a position to be uh, a clinical trainee. Sections two, three, and four adds licensed alcohol and drug counselors to the list of professionals eligible to participate in the health professional education loan forgiveness program. Section five requires the Board of Psychology to have at least two members from outside the seven county metro area and two members from a community of color or an underrepresented community on their board. Um, section six requires four of the 40 hours of continuing education uh, to be focused on culture, cultural competence, cultural humility, and being culturally informed. Section seven requires the Board of Marriage and Family Therapy to have at least two members from outside the seven county metro area and two members from a community of color or an underrepresented community. Section eight requires marriage and family therapists to have at least four of their 40 hours of continuing ed, again, be focused on culture. Section nine requires the Board of Behavioral Health and Therapy to have at least three members from outside the seven county metro area and three members from a community of color or underrepresented community. Section 10 requires a licensed professional clinical counselor or professional counselor to have at least four of their 40 hours, again, focused on culture. Section 11 requires social workers to have at least four of their 40 hours of continuing ed uh, uh, be on culture. I will mention that the social workers already have, their board already has a requirement in terms of geography and diversity. Section 12 expands who can be a mental health practitioner um, this is to make sure that people who are in an undergrad social work, psychology, or counseling program who are completing a practicum um, can actually be paid as a mental health practitioner so they're not doing that work for free, which uh, eliminates a barrier. And also making sure that someone who's in a graduate program who had not done an undergrad internship program also can be viewed as a mental health practitioner. Section 13 expands the use of mental health grants uh, controlled by the Department of Human Services to include paying for supervision for clinical trainees from BIPOC communities um, in clinics that um, do provide care to people who are in medical assistance, and also to pay for traditional, spiritual, and holistic um, practices from specific cultural communities. Uh, Section 14 creates a culturally informed and responsive mental health task force. Um, so we want the task force to kind of keep the focus on this issue, uh, making sure that our workforce becomes not only, not only culturally diverse, but culturally informed as well. Section 15 creates a work group to discuss the possible alternative pathways to licensure without sacrificing quality. Um, we want the boards and others to come together to kind of discuss barriers to licensure and to develop recommendations. We're not saying what those recommendations are, but just they need to come back with a report. Section 16 requires um, the licensing boards to come together to develop recommendations on how to provide supervision across all the different licenses and to make it easier for people, especially in greater Minnesota um, and BIPOC communities to obtain supervision in order to become licensed. 
according to the Department of Health data, less than 50% of people who graduate actually go on to be licensed. And so we want to make sure that we're making that happen. Section 17 appropriates funds for the culturally informed and responsive task force. Section 18 appropriates funds for the continuing education needed for BIPOC mental health professionals to become a supervisor. And Section 19 appropriates funds for the licensed alcohol and drug counselors to access the professional loan forgiveness program and appropriates additional funds for the health professional loan forgiveness program to target mental health professionals from BIPOC communities. So a, lar a rather large bill, um, but, but certainly uh, comprehensive in trying to address the many barriers that we have uh, for people becoming mental health professionals. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Ms. Abderholden. There is a lot in this bill and a lot that has needed to happen for a long time, so appreciate that. Um, next on the agenda for testimony, I have Sam Sands. Uh, Mr. Sands, are you here? I am, Madam Chair. I wonder if maybe I should testify after um, the bill sponsor, the Representative Vang's testifiers. Oh, oh, well, if you wish. Okay. I mean, I that's fine. I have uh, Ms. Yang is here as well. So go ahead, please. Dr. Yang. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Pahua Yang from the Amherst Wilder Foundation in St. Paul. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you so much for your time today. In order to give every Minnesotan who needs it the very best opportunity to help, <coughs> excuse me, for help in recovery, we need high quality mental health and substance use disorder services. And in order to provide high quality treatment, we need accessible and competent clinicians. To develop and support competent clinicians, it's important to have sustainable ways to train and mentor our pipeline of clinical trainees. We also need to be able to keep good clinicians in the field. In addition, it's so important that the field represents and is able to be responsive to the needs of diverse Minnesotans and that, <coughs> excuse me, and that we are encouraging and promoting ongoing learning in the field, especially if we want to create a more culturally competent workforce. This is, as others have said, a very comprehensive bill aimed at many of the systemic barriers that providers in the field encounter with the support of many, um, including some of you in this virtual room. We have made a lot of gains recently in strengthening the mental health system in Minnesota um, from creating uniform service standards so that, to that clarify the delivery of mental health services to the support of integrated treatment models like certified community behavioral health clinics. But what we need to complement all of this really great progress is to ensure that we are continually building and maintaining the workforce to be responsive to the evolving needs in our state. We have a workforce shortage in our field and we especially have a workforce shortage of black, indigenous, and people of color in the field. And there are significant barriers that currently exist in our systems. And as I've said in other committee hearings, what's heartbreaking to me is that in this time of high need, due to many of these barriers, we have people who are leaving the field. During the pandemic across our state and certainly across our country, we are facing unprecedented levels of stress and trauma, and it's going to be even more critical that we have a strong system that's able to respond to the mental health needs of all Minnesotans. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Yang. Appreciate your testimony today. Okay, uh, Mr. Sands, you're on. Welcome. Madam Chair, thank you. Um, my name is Sam Sands. I am the executive director of the Minnesota Board of Psychology. Um, the mission of the board is uh, to protect the public through licensure, regulation, and education to promote access to safe, competent, and ethical psychological services. The board is uh, broadly supportive of the ideas um, and, and concepts uh, in this bill. Uh, there's one thing that I would like to draw the committee's attention to, where I believe there is an opportunity to do some more work. Um, Section 15 
uh, relates to alternative pathways to licensure. Um, and uh, I, I think I would agree with most of the uh, most of what testifiers are saying is we have a workforce shortage. We we need to increase the uh, the um, the diversity of our workforce. Those are laudable goals. Um, I have some concerns about the way that Section 15 is drafted. Um, there's been some progress made with the language. Um, however, I don't think that the data bears out the presumption that is written within section 15 that we should be making recommendations about alternative pathways to licensure at this point in time. Um, my, what I would say is that um, we should start collecting the data and do the analysis of the data. And if the data bears out that there are disparities between uh, groups of people or the, the tests uh, are um, discriminating against uh, BIPOC communities, then we we address that root and we, we address that and rip that out root and stem um, and make sure that 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 we know that that's not acceptable. And, and perhaps some of the recommendations could be made at that point in time um, about what alternative pathways could be to licensure. The reality is at this point, there's no there's no data that um, definitively puts out there that uh, there is there is a disparity at this point. Um, you know, representations have been made that 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 we can make recommendations um, that may uh, essentially. I guess what I'm saying is that there are representations that we don't have to necessarily make alternative license re re uh, recommendations. I look at the language and I just feel like if the data was not there that identifies disparities that I would have a hard time making a recommendation for an alternative pathway for licensure when the data might not support that. I don't know what the data is going to say because nobody has this data at the point at this point. Also, um, you know, from the Board of Psychology's perspective, from my profession, I'll just make one very brief comment about the data that's presented with respect to, you know, 49% of psychologists not being graduating from licensing programs who don't end up going on to get licensed. If you look at the APA accredited programs in the state, which are the programs that train our clinical health providers that get psychologist licenses, they are very rigorous about the data that they track. Um, over a 10 year period, the three programs, which are the University of Minnesota, University of St. Thomas, St. Mary's, University of Minnesota has two programs. Um, they've graduated 227 um, psychologists from those programs. And they also have to track the number of licensees, the number of those graduates who end up getting licensed. And 190 of those people um, have reported that they get licensed to their program. So we're talking about um, you know, 84% roughly licensure rate. Um, and we can presume that they pass the national exam because there's no state uh, that allows um, psychologists to bypass the EPPP, which is the national exam. Um, and then I just say that some of those, uh, some of those um, people are not actually seeking licensure because they might teach. Um, so that's just to say that some of this data is still a little bit mushy. I think there needs to be more study about what that data is. Um, and we shouldn't have predetermined um, outcomes in the legislation. It should be more open-ended and allow us to explore what the data is and explore what the data would tell us. Um, and then make recommendations if those recommendations are supported by the data. Um, all right. Well, thank you, Mr. Sands. Yep. All right. Um, so um, I guess I would, uh, before we take any member questions, I think it would be, uh, I want, would want to see if the author wants to respond or one of the other testifiers wants to respond. Um, Representative Bang. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, once again, you know, in regards to the alternative pathways task force, 
Uh, this is part of the ask from the coalition work that's been done for many years. It is not just up to the boards to decide whether or not there should be a task force. This is part of a wider community ask in which the board and its licensees are a part of. Uh, this task force you know, doesn't create an alternative pathways. It just starts the conversation of whether that is feasible. And if so, what could that look like? It is an opportunity in regards to uh, the data for the task force to seek out the data to see if there are disproportionate passing of the national exams. Um, and so I, I think, uh, you know, the concerns of, of uh, Mr. Stans present um, is addressed in this task force. Um, and I will just leave it at that. All right. Um, so I see we have a question. Unless, uh, I don't know if uh, Ms. Abder Holden, were you preparing to respond to? Um, Madam Chair, I just wanted to note that the data was from the Department of Health, and it covered 2007 through 2014 and looked at all the various licenses, and it was 49.1% when you added them all up um, that uh, that became licensed. And so, you know, whichever category you want to go in, and perhaps, you know, obviously there might be newer data, but that was the data we had to go on at the time. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Representative Ryer. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you, uh, Representative Ma Fang, for bringing this forward. Um, to Mr. Sands, um, as a data person myself, when, when I hear uh, the data have not been uh, collected and, and that kind of thing, what I'm wondering is from a board of psychology perspective, what have you been doing organizationally around these issues to, to try and understand the need and advanced solutions, because that's what the other thing, I'm a data person, I'm a solutions person. So I just kind of give those both to you and, um, and just ask for your comment. All right, thank you. Mr. Sands. Madam Chair, Representative Ryer, thanks uh, for that question. I really appreciate it. Um, we have been working with um, the national testing uh, the National Association of State and Provincial Psychology Boards. They are the group that administers the national examination for psychologists, the EPPP. Um, working with them to make sure that they are um, using diverse sources of test item writers, that their validations are up to what is the industry standard or exceed the industry standard in terms of psychology testing. I'm not gonna be able to answer the technical questions related to that piece of it, but there is a large push to have, um, to have them uh, identify this data. They were not collecting demographic data. Uh, they've just started to collect demographic data. Um, similarly, uh, the Board of Psychology had not collected demographic data for a long time um, because we didn't wanna introduce bias into our application process with you know unintended bias. However, um, we are now working on a project to start collecting that data for a very limited use of looking at what the passage rates might be. Um, but yes, I think that those are important questions. Those are what we're doing. Um, and I think that once we start getting a significant amount of data and, and you know especially once the ASPPB and EPPP providers start um start uh, hand uh, start identifying what that data is we'll be able to see what the results are representative ryer uh, madam chair so um mr sands what kind of time threshold would you envision be required for uh for data collection of this scope and, and this targeted need mr sands Madam Chair, Representative Ryer, um, I would think that a year of data collection would, we generally get about uh, 200 applications a year. And I know that um, of those applications, we would want to see, um, we would want to see a number of tests taking. So the way our licensing process, people don't automatically take the test at the time they apply. So maybe at one, I think that at 100 exams or 150 exams taken, we could start looking at that data. But again, I wouldn't, I, 
unlike yourself, Representative Ryer, wouldn't call myself a data person per se, uh, but I would listen to the advice of what our um, you know, our partners at uh, Minute would say about statistical analysis and the validity of that. Plus, I do have a board of um, practitioners, psychologists, some of whom work in the testing field, uh, who would be able to advise us on when it would be um, statistically sound for us to start making those kind of uh, uh, data determinations. All right. Uh, anything I, further, Representative Breyer? If I may. Um, Please. So thinking about that, thinking about the, the need and the opportunity cost of waiting and the risk um, to the communities who are affected and whose lived experience is driving this need, my question would be, what are the, the risks to proceeding uh, with the presumption um, that we can trust people to bring forward legitimate needs that do not in any way affect the ability of, of people for whom the mainstream approaches work. I, I, I challenge that there's a great deal of risk in terms of moving forward, um, even in a preliminary way. I, I, I worry when, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time on task forces and I've spent a lot of time in organizations that are trying to change. And often um, the need for data collection becomes the way to um, slow things down. And I'm not in any way implying that that's the case here. I'm just saying that's been my observation mm -hmm. in the past. Um, so just with that observation, unless you'd care to comment, Mr. Sands. Well, Mr. Sands. Madam Chair, Representative Ryer, what I would say is I believe that the task force report is due um, to this committee in February of um, 2023. And I am hopeful that by that point in time that we will have collected the data and be able to do the analysis that, that would, that would um, you know, meet that requirement. All right, and I'm gonna, um... Thank you. And so um, I'm just going to, I have a, just a brief comment and then I'm going to let a Representative Vang uh, close up on the bill. And, and I looked at the language that Mr. Sams is talking about. And honestly, I think this is, can be resolved. I, you know, I just to suggest, um, you know, that just, I think what I'm hearing is that just the, the way this is drafted is causing a bit of heartburn and Honestly, I'm not really hearing a disagreement with what it's trying to do. Just, you know, if we just said instead of, for example, you know, instead of uh, develop recommendations for creating alternative pathways for licensure, maybe if we said develop recommendations to remove barriers that are identified. And then if that means having alternative pathways, then that would be alternative pathways, but maybe there are other things too that need to be removed. I'm just a, a thought, but you know, this is for future conversation and hopefully we can um, figure out a way to make this happen because I, I think uh, many of us feel that this is a really a necessary effort and that we, we want this to go forward and we want this to happen and we want this work to continue and we don't want any unnecessary delays as I think Representative Ryer was kind of getting to. So um, Representative Vang, please, uh, if you would uh, have final words on the bill. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Chair. You know, I would just say that the work has already been done and we know what we need to do. We have already identified the barriers. Um, this bill is a matter of realizing that work and taking action. Uh, and we worked with all these stakeholders to make it so they can implement that work. Um, and so I was just saying, this is a good bill and, and with your support, uh, we can start addressing the workforce shortage. Okay, well, thank you very much for, your, for that. Thank you for bringing us this really super important issue. And with that, House File 790 as amended is laid over for possible inclusion in the finance bill. Thank you. Okay, um, we're gonna move now to Representative Lee's bill. House File 644, and since uh, Representative Lee, Chair Lee is not on the committee, uh, the chair will move that House File 644 be first engrossment be laid over for possible inclusion in the finance bill. 
Chair Lee, welcome. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and committee members for the opportunity to present House File 604. I do have the A2 amendment, met, Madam Chair. All right, and you would prefer to move that right now and then we can discuss the bill as amended, so. Uh, yes, please. Okay, so the chair will move the A2 author's amendment on behalf of Chair Lee and uh, with that, all in favor of the adoption of the A2 author's amendment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion prevails. The amendment is adopted to your bill as amended. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So just so you all have a context of where this bill came from, it came from several discussions that I had with my uh, constituents regarding the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency 2017 uh, enforcement settlement of uh, $2.5 million worth of motor metals recycling in my district. At that time, community members were concerned that uh, the Normas recycling have have been found to uh, pollute it and you know violate some of their permits and only six hundred thousand of the two uh, two point five million was coming back to address some of the uh, health impact that folks are experiencing and as you may all know uh, the area where I represent we have some of the highest asthma uh, hospitalization rate in the state of Minnesota and so folks were mm -hmm. extremely concerned with the poor air quality over by my area and. I found out that currently money recovered by the MPCA in litigation or in settlement of a permit violation that could have resulted in litigation, it must be deposited in the general fund. And so they that's one of the reasons why they couldn't really uh, tap into that settlement penalty so that they could really start to work to address that. And so what my bill does is I create, it creates an exception in state law that will allow for uh, any money that's recovered over $250,000 in litigation or enforcement settlement to uh, to be distributed back to the local local community health board where the facility is located. And the amendment that I adopted was to address some of the concerns that I have heard from uh, committee members on this committee and from the environment committee that uh, some of our uh, health board are pretty small that they may not have the capacity to do so. And so my amendment addressed that concern by allowing for at the local community health board to request the Department of Health to assist. And also in the amendment it allows for up to 5% of uh, the money that's recovered by the MPCA to be uh, used for administrative costs either by the uh, local health board or the Department of Health as requested. And in, in the bill, the MPCA must notify the applicable uh, community health board within 30 days of, fi of final court order uh, in the lit litigation or at the effective date of the settlement and collect the money and transfer it to the local health board for them to do uh, some community engagement to incorporate their concerns into a project that addresses the residents' health concerns resulting from their exposure to pollution. And so uh, this piece was another part of the amendment too where uh, committee members thought that the scope of the bill that I had environment was too broad. And so I want to really focus on uh, the health concerns resulting from the exposure to pollution so that the local community health board and uh, Department of Health as requested can really work to address that going forward. And so uh, this proposal directs the transfer and use of money only and does not create a right of intervention in the litigation or settlement of the enforcement action for any person or entity. And so uh, with that, Madam Chair, I'll just end there and entertain any uh, questions. Thank you very much, Chair Lee, appreciate that. Um, are there questions from members? Okay, okay, uh, Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, thank you, Representative Lee, for bringing this forward. Any money to be taken away from the MPCA, I'm in favor of, okay, and given to local control. But uh, that's just a side note. But, you know, on the money that would go to these boards, I see that there's assistance from the Department of Health, but is there any criteria on what it would be spent on? What projects, I mean, do they have to be peer reviewed projects to make sure that they actually make a difference or is it pretty open-ended on what type of projects that they can spend the money on? Chair Lee. Uh, Madam Chair and Representative Gruhagen, uh, this is where I uh, specifically address this in the, uh, amendment where we want to allow for the flexibility for the community that's been impacted by the uh, pollution to really provide feedback to the local health community health board on the health concerns that they have so that they could tailor this to address that. And specifically in my district, 
uh, lead poisoning is a, a big concern. And so some of the money that were uh, received by the city of Minneapolis Health Board were used to do blood lead testing, to do some lead education. And, and so I think that we allow this uh, to have the flexibility for the local community to decide what are the health concerns that they have so that the money can be used to address that. Yeah, thank you. Representative Grunhagen, any follow-up? No, that's, thank you, Madam Chair. All right, thank you, thank you. And it just occurs to me, Representative Lee, that it's pretty hard to know what kind of situations these might be, right? This could be a whole range of things. So I, I think the flexibility is really important. Um, okay, not seeing any other concerns here, or questions from members. And I guess I would just, um, uh, Chair Lee, when you uh, worked on the amendment, you uh, just you worked with various entities to get this to get this together, right? You worked with I know you work with local public health, and if you could just say that, and then maybe just uh, give us your closing comments. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I did reach out to the local public health too, uh, just to get their feedbacks, and uh, they, you know, they they did say that you know in some instances you know they could take the the money and to do the work that we're asking them to do with my proposal and oftentimes you know if there is a large enough case that there's going to be uh, a lot of work for them and that they may not have the capacity to do so and so uh, allowing for the language that we have to request the department of health to step in i think that that's a good path forward and um, i just received an email uh, today i don't want to speak on their behalf i don't know if they're here but in the email they they said they didn't ha have any issue with the language that i have and so Hopefully, uh, we provide some comfort for the local public health to, to really work with our constituents so that uh, any community that's potentially impacted by pollution going forward can get their health concerns uh, addressed. I hope that that's not the case, but this will be there for them if uh, that is an issue. And thank you, Madam Chair and uh, community members for the opportunity to present this bill. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Chair Lee. With that, House File 644, as amended, is laid over for possible inclusion in the finance bill. So thank you so much. Okay, uh, the next bill on the agenda is House File 8, which is my bill. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna move uh, House File 8 to be laid over for possible inclusion in the finance bill. And members, we heard this bill back, I believe it was February 1st. So this is another hearing, but we have um, today, I am bringing a, um, a DE amendment. So I'm gonna move adoption of the DE1 amendment to bring the bill into shape for some work that's been done on it. And if we can adopt that, then I will explain what how the bill is different now. Um, so if we could, um, all those in favor of adoption of the DE1 amendment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion prevails, thank you. So the DE1 amendment um, changes the program. Um, if you recall, this is the pharmacy carve out from the um, medical, from in medical assistance. So from the managed care organizations, it carves out the pharmacy benefit. Um, we did hear from some organizations that are what we call 340B organizations. And just to explain this a little bit, I think this has been kind of a new concept. It, and the, the legislature has dealt with some 340B issues before, but this is a federal program. And actually, 340B is not mentioned in the legislation. So it was a bit of a surprise to me to hear some a reaction from these organizations. And I, in the process of this, I, I learned a little bit about the 340B program. So this is a federal program that requires drug manufacturers to provide pharmaceuticals at very deep discounts to certain organizations that um, take care of low-income people. So some of our hospitals are 340B organizations, and there are others as well. And I did not know that um, what's happening with our medical assistance program, with our managed care portion of medical assistance, is that when these, um, uh, when a patient who's on medical assistance managed care 
goes to the pharmacy and gets and goes to a 340B pharmacy to get their drug, that the amount of money that is paid by the MCO to that pharmacy results in, a, I would call, a profit for the pharmacy. So there are there is kind of a flow of money that is going through our managed care program to organizations. I'm sure all of them are organizations that members want to support and don't want to harm. But nevertheless, it is sort of a hidden subsidy that is happening within our managed care program. And so when we propose to take away that pharmacy program from the managed care organizations, this would impact these organizations that are getting what I would call this hidden subsidy. So what this legislation does, what the, what the um, DE1 amendment is doing is making some changes. First of all, it is carving out only the um, pharmaceuticals that a patient would get from a pharmacy. It is leaving alone the pharmaceuticals that would be um, administered by the provider in the office. So this should, I think, get rid of some of the concerns that have been expressed about coordination of care. Uh, because if the provider is administering the drug, we're not, we're not carving that out. Um, another thing that we're doing here is we are creating a pool of money. And we've done this in prior situations where we've uh, changes that we made um, have impacted the 340B organizations. We're creating a pool of funding in this uh, legislation, which is intended to keep these organizations whole. So hearing the difficulties that they would expect to have if we were to just take away this source of funding, um, we would try to make up that source of funding through um, by doing it the direct way. And I have to say, as a legislator, I find that a lot more palatable because while I understand their concern about losing this source of funding, the idea that we are doing a, a hidden source of funding, that dollars are flowing through our medical assistance program as subsidies for other organizations that we, we don't really have any handle on it. We don't know how much it is, where it goes. And um, while we all, I know, are concerned of keeping these organizations whole, I think this is still a much better way to do it, that we in the legislature would know how much, how much these organizations uh, need to stay whole. So that's what the legislation is doing. Um, another piece that is a change in this DE amendment is to be explicitly carving out the uh, Minnesota Care Program. And that is because the Minnesota care program is, is under different rules, and we can't get the same um, pharmacy discounts on the Minnesota care program than we can as we can on the medical assistance program. So a study in the section three of the bill of the DE now, section three, talks about the, um, the uh, direction to the commissioner of human services to study and come back with some recommendations on the feasibility of expanding this program. And we've added Minnesota Care to that piece of the bill to just look at whether there are ways to uh, also do better with our Minnesota Care drug program. So that is essentially um, what the changes are. I believe this lines up pretty well with what is actually in the governor's budget this year, which is actually a change from, from previously. And so I've, I've got some folks here who can probably help to answer questions if there are questions on the DE amendment. So um, with that, I would take questions. And I'm not seeing any. And I do believe we have some testifiers. And let me just find my agenda here again. What did I do with it? That's the problem with. All these too many papers. Okay, so we could hear from the testifiers now. And um, first on the list for testifying is Sarah, Sarah Durr. Mr. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee.
my name is Dr. Sarah Durr, and I'm a pharmacist by training and serve as the executive director of the Minnesota Pharmacists Association. Thank you for introducing and improving this important proposal. I last testified in support of the legislation that we would put in place a fee-for-service model to administer the medical assistance drug spend. We also support the idea of including the MinCare ACA waiver population, which you amended further, which your amendment further clarifies today. House File 8 and the Delete Everything Amendment would eliminate the managed care and commercial pharmacy benefit managers from management of the state of Minnesota's medical assistance drug spend and move to a direct fee-for-service drug spend model. Currently, Minnesota has about 75 to 80% of the MA drug spend management under contract with PBMs through their MCOs. We greatly appreciate the work that has been done by the author to focus the bill's language and to hold harmless federally authorized DISH hospitals. The federal 340B program ensures that some of the most vulnerable Minnesotans have access to dis dis discounted prescription medications, which is mandated by the federal law on drug manufacturer pricing. We have concerns about the impact that current language would have on 340B entities and the patients they serve. As written, we believe this program could be, could be impacted and there could be a potential for negative financial implications to pharmacies in Minnesota who participate in the 340B program and are not connected to a DISH hospital. We are working with Representative Liebling, the department and other stakeholders on these issues and this important legislation and are confident that the fee-for-service model for Minnesota Medicaid, medical assistance Medicaid can work and is preferred. Currently, 28 states Medicaid administrators in the U.S. have implemented a direct fee-for-service Medicaid drug spend model or cost-based transparency. An example of a state that has moved away from PBM managed Medicaid to, car to a carve-out fee-for-service model is West Virginia, where the Medicaid agency started managing the medical managed care prescription drug benefit directly in July of 2017. An actuarial study forecasted a $30 million savings for the state. We know, now know from the study that they actually saved $54.4 million for the first year and continue to save in 2020 and in 2021. Recent studies for Medicaid managed care programs in Ohio and New York as well as scathing state auditors reports in Pennsylvania have indicated that PBMs are overcharging taxpayers for their services in Medicaid managed care, reimbursing pharmacies low for medication dispensed, billing the state Medicaid program high for the cost of those medications and retaining the difference. The promise that PBMs are going to save states money has not been realized. And in fact, based on the 2019 Minnesota Management and Budget Fiscal Note, we know that the state of Minnesota citizens and healthcare providers will do better under this model. We support HF8's HF premise and promise. However, any move to 100% fee-for-service model will also need to account for patient access and provider compensation and encourage the author to expand the Health Harmless 340B provision to all entities that are 340B. In closing, I look forward to working with you, your House colleagues, the governor, and Minnesota State Senate to advance this important bill. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Durr. Appreciate your testimony today. Uh, Dan Andreessen. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, Dan Andreessen with the Minnesota Council of Health Plans. Debate on this issue in past committees has been a, who is a better entity to manage drug benefits or state public programs, managed care organizations or DHS? I respectfully submit the question we should be asking is whether a drug carve out is in the best interest of Minnesotans on state public programs and how does it impact their daily lives? It's hard to predict when a new program outlined in legislation will be successful. In the case of House File 8, you have the advantage to look back over the past year and a half because the MA drug benefit has already started towards a carve out in 2019. Starting July 1st of that year, MCOs were required to adopt DHS's preferred drug list and the prior authorization criteria set by the department to steer members to preferred drugs on this list. As a committee overseeing DHS, there should certainly be a fiscal evaluation of the current program before expanding it to allow DHS to operate as a PBM. But also just as important, we should evaluate the real world impact of the current program on MA enrollees. Minnesotans on MA are those with the lowest incomes who are elderly and those living with disabilities and chronic conditions. They're the most vulnerable Minnesotans. What we know is consumer choice has been reduced. We've gone from a program where MA enrollees could choose from multiple MCOs with multiple formularies to now just one governed by DHS. In 2020, we saw appeals nearly doubled from previous years as enrollees sought to maintain access to existing medications. On Monday, this committee heard three bills regarding access to HIV medications. These bills are a result of changes to the preferred drug list over the past year, 
and HIV activists were rallying outside of DHS in October, demanding an end to these coverage changes. Many Minnesotans living with chronic conditions have been impacted by similar changes, and I urge members to reach out and hear their stories. Before proceeding with a full carve out, there should be a thorough evaluation of this program since 2019, including the impacts to enrollees and their health. We'd also suggest that if the study is going to be uh, taking place as done, or uh, as written in section three, it should be done by an outside third party rather than DHS who has a financial stake in this proposal. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Andreessen. Uh, we have Linda Jerga. Lisa Berga. Welcome. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Lisa Berga and I'm the Chief Financial Officer at Lakewood Health System. Lakewood is a 25 bed critical access hospital located in Staples, Minnesota. We offer a full spectrum of care from birth through end of life. As an independent rural hospital, Lakewood is tackling enormous pressures to deliver high quality health care and serve the complex and challenging needs of the impoverished population in our service area. Over the past year, Lakewood provided care to over 28,000 individuals, totaling more than 100,000 visits. Our primary service area includes the counties of Morrison, Todd, and Wadena. This three county region is home to some of the most aged and impoverished populations in Minnesota. These factors greatly contribute to 65% of our patient population comprising of Medicare and Medicaid recipients. Lakewood's participation in the 340B program allows us the ability to stretch scarce federal resources and provide comprehensive services to the rural residents we serve. As an anchor institution, we have the responsibility to not only provide high quality health care, but also ensure a thriving community for some of Minnesota's most vulnerable populations. A few examples of our efforts to make safety net investments include ensuring access to critical health services that historically operate at a loss, but are essential to the vitality of rural residents. Services such as 24 seven emergency department, ambulance services, behavioral health services, and full obstetrics care are fueled in part by 340B savings. Also operation of an onsite food pharmacy, dispensing healthy food to over 600 food insecure families and seniors monthly. As well as annually, Lakewood provides over $600,000 of high quality health care to uninsured or underinsured patients at no cost to them. Lakewood takes our responsibility to leverage all available resources like 340B to ensure we can deliver high quality health care and community investments to nearly 30,000 Minnesotans. Whether intentional or not, House File 8 would create a Medicaid payment cut, which would impact our ability to do what we do best, and that is care for our rural communities. I encourage the state legislature and this committee to work hand in hand with Minnesota Critical Access Hospitals and the Minnesota Hospital Association to bring forth policy solutions that do not have steep and unintended consequences that disproportionately impact rural and underserved Minnesota communities. I ask that we keep 340B covered entities receiving the savings we desperately need as 100% of the dollars stay right here in Minnesota, impacting those that need us most. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Berga. Um, we have next, we have Danny Ackert. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Danny Acker, and I serve as the Director of State Government Relations for the Minnesota Hospital Association. I am testifying today to share our concerns with the potential impacts of Hospital 8 as amended on the federal 340B drug pricing program, or 340B. MHA has also submitted a letter to the committee that provides more details on this issue. We appreciate Representative Liebling's efforts to amend the bill and address impacts to 340B. However, upon initial review, the newly proposed increase to disproportionate share payments as a mitigation to 340B cuts is insufficient. For example, critical access hospitals do not receive disproportionate share payments, yet all 78 rural critical access hospitals in Minnesota are eligible to participate in 340B. Another example of how the amendment falls short is the impact to the children's hospitals, which are up against their disproportionate share payment cap, but likewise can participate in 340B. Further, disproportionate share payments are designed to supplement Medicaid inpatient reimbursements, while 340B is exclusively for outpatient drugs. While House Valley could generate savings for the state, it comes at the expense of 340B covered entities. Much of the potential savings will accrue to the federal government rather than remain invested in our underserved communities. When the state Medicaid agency receives the benefits of discounts on outpatient drugs via drug rebates, these savings must be shared with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, per the federal match. Therefore, at a minimum, 50% of the savings are returned to CMS. In contrast, if 340B covered entities retain the savings, 
100% of the dollars stay in Minnesota as intended and are reinvested, reinvested into activities that increase access to medically underserved patients across our state. There is no other program that allows for providers to purchase significantly discounted drugs and regenerate savings to invest into services for underserved patients and communities across Minnesota. 340B works for our patients and our communities. Thank you for considering my comments today. All right, thank you, Mr. Ackert. Okay, we have member questions. We have Representative Grunhagen and then Schultz. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I, uh, I've also received some additional input on this bill. I do appreciate the DE amendment and that you backed off a little bit. But I do identify with uh, Mr. Andreessen, you know, the Lakewood Hospital and the Minnesota Hospital Association. We're going to be hurting our rural hospital and uh, health care access. We're, and I think their testimony should be taken into consideration. The, um, uh, you know, I know the amendment backed off some, but I think that it's the camel's nose under the tent. And we're going in a direction that when we look at other states, it doesn't turn out very well. For instance, according to the county, you're gonna hurt the county-based healthcare system also. And according to the letter submitted, I think it's available to all members. In New York, when analysis was done, this, this type of approach actually increased the cost of drugs over a five-year period by 1.5 billion. In California, they, they also saw over a five-year period of time a net increase of drugs as the department, DHS, would start chasing rebates on name-brand drugs in order to pocket the difference and therefore drive up the cost of the overall program. I'm not saying there isn't problems with PBMs, but they do give additional choice. I think that any problems with the PBMs can be addressed in a different way, and this takes us down a road that is going to cost more, hurt our rural hospitals, which are already hurting based on the testimony, and uh, not keep 100% of the 340B money in the state of Minnesota to help with healthcare access. So I strongly uh, recommend that me members do additional uh, research on this. It sounds like you have, Madam Chair, but I have to oppose this bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Grunhagen. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Chair Labeling. So this is a perfect example of how a simple idea of trying to get discounts, volume-based discounts on pharmaceutical drugs is not simple because of how complex our healthcare system is with these indirect subsidies to provide uh, coverage and care for low-income households. So we definitely need federal reform. This is a perfect example of how trying to fix something um, is difficult because we're not appropriately uh, subsidizing at the federal level health care access for everybody in the country. So I applaud uh, Chair Liebling's attempt to do this. And, you know, it, it should seem obvious that if the state can do volume-based purchasing, the state would benefit from these discounts and use that revenue because our state does not have to make a profit. We just have to break even, hopefully, or... And then use that money from the rebates and discounts as a state to provide um, low uh, coverage for low-income households. So um, I'm glad you brought this bill forward and looking forward to um, working on it with you in the future. All right. Well, thank you very much, Representative Schultz. Are there other questions from members? Okay. Uh, not seeing any. And um, so... I would just, I guess, say that, um, you know, this, we, I see that, you know, there's still a little bit of work to be done here, but I, I hope that members, you know, notwithstanding Representative Grunhagen's comments, you know, every one of these plans has its own PBM. And we've heard a lot of testimony this year, the last couple of years about PBMs, how they operate. I mean, Representative Grunhagen keeps saying, I don't like PBMs, I don't like what they do, but everything that we do that tries to get at and control what PBMs do does not seem to be good enough. So, you know, we need to um, start to straighten out our programs. I've heard from some of the, some of the groups, um, you know, talk about this, like the state grabbing the money. Members, this is Medicaid money. This is, yes, it's half federal. It's taxpayer dollars for which 
our constituents expect us to be responsible. And so I will continue to work on the bill because I don't want to hurt these 340B organizations, that's for sure, and especially not rural hospitals. Maybe we need to have a hearing in this committee on what the funding is for these hospitals and what all their revenue streams are, because it's obvious that we don't know. We don't understand how they are financed, either the big ones or the small ones. And this is just one example of obviously there is a hidden revenue stream here, and it is coming at the expense of Minnesota taxpayers as well as federal taxpayers, obviously, because that is what Medicaid is. And we as Minnesotans want to support organizations that take care of people who are low income. We as Minnesotans, as legislators, want to make sure that there are sufficient resources, hospitals and other providers in all areas of the state. That's for sure. We share that in common. But I, I am uh, you know, really concerned when we find out that there is this hidden stream coming from our Medicare, our, sorry, our Medicaid funding, our, our, um, the funding that we appropriate for medical assistance, and it's going and doing things that we have no idea. And even if we take the 340B organizations out of this, when we pay that capitated rate for health care, we very much lose control and lose insight into what these organizations are doing with our money. So this is a problem. And obviously, when you start to scratch the surface of this, you get all this response, which just shows that we need to go, rather than backing off, we need to go further to understand what is being done with the money that we are supposed to be in control of. So I will continue to, um, I will continue to work on the bill. And uh, I appreciate appreciate the uh, conversation members and I am having the final word on the bill. We're not going to continue to debate it today, but um, so house file eight as amended is going to be laid over for possible inclusion in the finance bill. Thank you members. As amended, I hope I said as amended. Okay. All right. The next bill on our agenda is on. Okay. Let's see. 202. So we're moving right along. Um, we might need to take a break at some point if we take a lot longer. But our next file on the agenda is House File 1576, Representative Bonner, who is on our committee. And Representative Bonner's motion will be that House File 1576 be laid over for possible inclusion in the finance bill. Representative Bonner. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, many of you know that I was the author of a previous a bill around the gag rule uh, that made sure that pharmacists could now discuss with patients uh, when they could receive uh, their medications for cheaper off the shelf than their copay. Uh, this is yet another in that line. Um, the bill before you is simple. The language is not long or complicated. What is complicated is the way that we pay for and reverse, or reimburse, excuse me, prescription drugs. We've devised elaborate methods designed to save money, but ultimately they fall significantly short. And in some cases, costing more across the system than state straightforward methods. In theory, reimbursement rates should cover the cost of dispensing the drug. That includes the cost of the drug itself, the pill bottle, the labels, and the cost of the pharmacist time. The reality, often these rates fall short. While larger chain pharmacies can often smooth out these anomalies, over time, it is increasingly harder for your corner drugstore to survive. With clawbacks, shrinking margins, and reimbursement rates that often do not cover the costs, these local resources are in danger of being more Americans see their local pharmacists more frequently than their own physician. In small drugstores across the state, pharmacists are trusted members of the community. Many know their patients by name and their drug history by heart, often catching errors in prescriptions or incorrect dosages and potential adverse drug react or reactions. These resources are indispensable. The bill before you does one simple thing. 
it removes the prohibition placed on pharmacists from discussing reimbursement rates. This will allow pharmacists to have the conversation about fair compensation to cover their costs without a gag clause that restricts them from advocating for their business and the patients they serve. The bill does not charge or change any rates or dictate prices. It's simply about transparency and having the tools to advocate on behalf of small corner pharmacies. Okay. And with that, Madam Chair, I do have uh, Dr. Durr here to speak on behalf of the bill as well. Very good. Okay, thank you, Representative Bonner. Dr. Durr, welcome back. Please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, again, my name is Dr. Sarah Durr. I'm the pharmacist by training and the executive director of the Minnesota Pharmacists Association. Thank you for allowing me to testify on behalf of pharmacists, community pharmacies, and independent pharmacy owners. 95% of patients live within five miles of a pharmacy. I'm here to testify in support of HF 1576 that would protect our independently owned pharmacies in Minnesota. Two years ago, the Minnesota legislature enacted a new chapter of insurance law that put in place for the first time licensure and regulation of pharmacy benefit managers or PBMs. MN chapter 62W does several things. The central to one of its sections is the legal framework that guides the contractual business relationship between a pharmacy, the payer, and the PBM. The PBM is subcontracted by a health insurer or HMO here in Minnesota. Also in 62W, there is a section that removes the prevention on what pharmacists can say or do in relation to the cost information of a medication provided to the patients. This is commonly referred to as a gag clause, which meant before 2019 that pharmacists in Minnesota were contractually obligated not to discuss the actual cost of the medication with their patients. 62W prohibits a PBM from enacting a gag clause in contracts with pharmacies. HF 1576 would expand upon 62W by adding a provision that would prohibit PBMs from contractually preventing a pharmacist from communicating with or speaking to the health insurer who subcontracts with the PBM. This additional protection for the health insurer, I'm sorry, this additional protection for pharmacists and the pharmacy owners would allow them to discuss their reimbursement rate with the health insurer. This legislation will help save independent and community pharmacies who currently are forced to sign these take it or leave it contracts that don't pay their drug acquisition costs and then oftentimes have arbitrary and unexplained retroactive fees. This legislation would also allow pharmacists not only to speak with the PBM, but to have the right to speak with the health insurer who has designed the benefit plan. Please support HF 1576 and I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, Dr. Durr, thank you so much for that. Um, are there questions for the author or for Dr. Durr? Representative Grunhagen. Must be my day to talk, Chair <laughs> Only um, today. Only today, yeah. <laughs> uh, I like this bill. I think I'm going to sign on as a co author because I talk to my independent pharmacists here in my district, and this is a major problem. So I would encourage members to support this. I appreciate Representative Boehner bringing it forward, and I will be sending a email in to become a co-author on this. So thank you, Representative Boehner. Uh, you're right. The independent pharmacies, especially out in rural area, are being closed down and bankrupted, and this is at least a, a, a step in the right direction. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Representative Grunhagen. Something we can agree on. Uh, are there further questions to the bill or comments? All right, not seeing any. Representative Bonner, would you care to have the last word on the bill? Well, thank you, Chair Liebling and, and members. Uh, certainly also thank you to Representative Grunhagen. It's always a good day when we can come to an agreement, mm -hmm. uh, on, particularly on something that can really help save some of these institutions in our small rural communities and small corner drug stairs across the state. Um, we know that they are an indispensable part of our communities. Um, and certainly, you know, while this bill, uh, there's certainly more work to be done. It is certainly the first step in the right direction to make sure that we can ensure the viability of these institutions. All right, thank you, Representative Bonner. And with that, House File 1576 is laid over for possible inclusion in the finance bill. Appreciate your bill. Okay, Representative Hewitt, you are up and Representative Hewitt is gonna move House File 
2121 and that it be laid over for possible inclusion in the finance bill. Representative Hewitt. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I have two amendments. I'd like to uh, get the bill in the order of the A1 and A2, if I could have those adopted now. Yes, and um, Representative Hewitt, I understand that these are um, technical amendments, is that correct? That is correct, Madam Chair. I'm sorry I didn't mention that. Okay. All right, so the A1, so Representative Hewitt moves the A1 technical amendment. Is there any discussion to the technical amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor of the A1, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion prevails, the A1 is adopted. And then um, the A2 amendment, is, um, I guess, is maybe less technical, Representative Hewitt. Did you want to um, move that one first to get the bill in the shape and then have it discussed also? I would, Madam Chair. All right. So Representative Hewitt moves the A2. I think this is the A2 author's amendment to get the bill in the correct shape. All those in favor of the A2 amendment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion prevails. The A2 is adopted. So with that, Representative Hewitt, um, please tell us about the bill as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair. And this is pretty much the uh, Minnesota Department of Health housekeeping bill this year. Um, section 1 and 2 modernizes references to technical standards and aligns them with federal policies related to electronic prescribing. Section three and four, remove the requirements to establish the and administer the Center of Health and Care Purchasing Improvements and removes required annual reports to the legislator. Section five to 13 um, addresses Minnesota case mix updates for nursing facilities. Sections 14 through 17, update the woman, infant, children, in other words, known as the WIC pro, food program to change how foods are provided to WIC participants. And lastly, section 18 is a clerical fix for, draft, for the drafting errors from laws from 2020, um, the seventh session, uh, chapter one, that contained incorrect statutory reference to the assisted living licensure bill. I do have the department here to get into the weeds if anybody would like to. Uh, therefore, that's my bill, Madam Chair. All right, thank you very much, Representative Hewitt. So um, does, I don't know if, um, thank you for walking through that section by section, you know, these housekeeping bills can be confusing and thank you for carrying this bill, Representative Hewitt. Um, I don't have any testifiers on my list. I don't know if there's anyone from the department who feels like they, uh, Department of Health, this would be, who feels like they need to say any more about the bill or clarify anything, or give them an opportunity if there is. All right, not seeing any volunteers. Are there any questions from members? Okay, not seeing any. So, well, pretty quick, Representative Hewitt, with that house file 2121 as amended is laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, we are up to, let's see, house file 1016, Representative Marquardt. Is Representative Marquardt, has he joined us? Yes, we are a little bit ahead of schedule. Okay, I'm not seeing Representative Marquardt just yet. So why don't we go, um, um, why don't we go to the next bill on the agenda and we'll come back to Representative Marquardt. So Representative Meckland, are you here? There he uh, is. I am here, thank Hello. you Madam Chair. Okay, so Representative Meckland is not on the committee. So the chair will move that House File 568 be laid over for possible inclusion in the finance bill. And Representative Meckland, welcome and go ahead and present your bill. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So this bill uh, was brought to me a few years back, or the idea behind it. So what this bill really does is uh, currently under state statute, if a paramedic or an EMT renders any aid to a canine um, dog that is injured in the line of duty, it's a gross misdemeanor, which for the not only the amount of taxpayer money we spend on these animals, um, but also our four-legged furry friends, I, I think it, it's, it's kind of disingenuous to say that, you know, somebody that has the ability to stop the bleeding or, you know, you keep them alive long enough to get them to a, the proper place. And, and um, this was brought to me by uh, a, a young man, and um, I'm going to turn it over to him. Um, and, and it's got bipartisan support, too, by the way. Uh, Representative Hewitt has been a good advocate for me on this one, and but I would like to turn it over to my testifier, Joey Burns, if you don't mind, Madam Chair. All right. Well, thank you, Representative Mecklen. Joey Burns, welcome. If you would just say your name and who you're with and go ahead and give us your testimony and introduce your friend. Hi, everybody. I'm Joey Burns. Um, I'm with Hibbing Police Department. I'm a canine handler there. This is my canine partner, Officer Chase. Um, He's uh, just a quick overview. Uh, thank you guys again for having us. He's been a member of the Hibbing Police Department here for, well, since December of 2018, we graduated canine school together. Um, he's with me 24 seven. He uh, comes to work with me. He comes home with me every day. So he is current, he's with me every day, 24 seven. So he's not only just a, a working dog, he's not only just a pet, but he's a member of the family. Um, we have a little one and I have my girlfriend here at home. So he he's just uh, another, member of the family. Um, with the current statute I was re uh, revising, I was looking at it. Um, if a dog gets hurt or killed in the line, or well, I should say hurt in the line of duty, technically per the state statute, um, for an EMT or first responder to work on him, it'd be considered veterinary practicing. And this bill is just to help assist with something where if uh, he were to get hurt in the line of duty, um, our first responders, our EMTs, we have a full-time fire department, they would be able to help render aid to him because sometimes at night, we do have veterinary um, buildings. We have uh, vets in the city of Hibbing and uh, surrounding cities. However, they close during business hours. And sometimes our nearest emergency vet is over an hour away in Duluth. Um, so for me to get him to the city of Duluth, even while running with lights and sirens, it would still take us 40 minutes. Um, in the time of 40 minutes, if he's seriously wounded, if he's stabbed or shot, uh, just me driving him to the Duluth, the chances of him making it are very slim. So this bill would help our fire department members be able to render aid to him to help us get him to a vet safely um, with better chance of survival. As you guys might know in Anoka on February 21st in the city of Anoka, K9 Bravo was shot while deployed after uh, armed carjackers stole somebody's vehicle and got in a pursuit with law enforcement. A pit maneuver was done and the armed carjackers fled from the vehicle uh, eventually K-9 Bravo was deployed to apprehend these uh, armed and dangerous individuals. The, one of the suspects turned a gun on officers, fired at officers, striking K-9 Bravo in the chest by the throat, uh, the trachea area. Um, he was eventually brought to the vet. However, he, uh, he made a full, he's making a full recovery. Uh, his injuries are extensive so that he's unknown if he's going to be able to return back to duty. Shortly after that, on the 25th of February, in the same week, Duluth Police Department responded to a domestic assault situation, and the suspect barricaded himself in the apartment. Um, at the time, it was unknown that he had any weapons. It was later found out uh, they ended up later found out that he had felony warrants, several felony warrants for his arrest for dangerous violations such as domestics and weapons charges. Uh, at the time, they did not know of any weapons. They sent Kana and Luna in to look for the male to locate him, uh, and Kana and Luna was shot uh, with a shotgun. She was killed. Um, they brought her to the vet, which was only a couple blocks away, but at that time, she was unable to make it through the surgery there. However, um, they ended up later uh, apprehending the male. Um, but uh, that same handler, a year or two years prior in 2019, also lost another canine partner of his, canine Haas, who was also shot and killed during a domestic situation uh, where they went to apprehend the suspect. Um, and we actually train with Officer Holler with the Duluth Police Department, so that kind of hits home for us, um, especially two, two of his canine partners in two years who he became very close bonded with, just like me and Chase here. Um, in 2021 alone, three canines have been killed in line of duty in America. 
uh, two for gunshot wounds and one during a car crash. One of them was K-9 Luna. And then the other one, there were two K-9s in Minnesota alone that were shot this year, K-9 Bravo and K-9 Luna. 21 K-9 deaths in 2020 alone. So, I mean, the numbers do add up throughout the year. Um, it, I think, again, like I said, our veterinary, our closest vet after hours is going to be over an hour away. Um, and this bill is permissive. That way, if uh, EMS is on another call, they, it's not a matter of they have to come and respond to this. However, um, if they're not required to, this bill is to help them if they are able to come and assist. Uh, there's also training out there for um, animal services to help save my partner uh, if something were to happen. Um, again, like I said, he, uh, he's more than, just a, more than just a pet, more than just a working dog. He is a member of our family. Um, I mean, we, we take him on vacations with us. He flies on the plane with us. Um, he comes in to read every night with our little one. We have a three-year-old at home. He comes in every night for bedtime stories. If we accidentally shut the door without him in there, he's scratching at the door waiting to get in for bedtime story. Um, I mean, we've done everything. And the last little bit is, I mean, I, this is it's just about to be more public information, but uh, he actually went with me to California. We are going to be uh, on a TV show coming up on A&E. Uh, <laughs> It'll be pretty cool. So just keep an eye out for that, you guys. But I, we appreciate your time. Um, not only the time for us to be here, um, because this is a once in a lifetime deal for us, but the time for you guys to look at this bill and hopefully uh, we can get this bill rolling so that way we help protect our four-legged canine officers here, four-legged canine officers here, not only not only um, officers, but their family members too. All right. Well, thank you so much, Officer Burns. We really appreciate that. We appreciate seeing Chase. We don't we don't get to see a lot of uh, a lot of canine partners on our uh, in our committee, so we appreciate that. And um, we have a question from Representative Hewitt. Representative Hewitt. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Representative Mecklen, for uh, making me a part of this bill. Uh, it's an honor to be a, a part of such bill. Canines save not only officers, but they save uh, citizens all the time too. Um, I've been fortunate enough to work with uh, several police officers that have had canines. Um, and I just got a note from the Minnesota Ambulance Association saying they are in full support of this bill. And uh, it's important that I've also note that I've heard from paramedics and EMTs all over the state, um, as this is one of their main bills that they would like to see passed. And also they are excited to go to training so they can become better at this task. So, uh, Madam Chair, I, this bill has my full support and I ask committee members to vote. On, uh, I'm sorry, we won't be voting, but as we move forward, <laughs> right. thank you. Well, thank you, Representative Hewitt. Um, Representative Schultz. I just wanna thank Officer Burns for coming to testify and talking about the losses we've had in Duluth of our canines. And my sons took that very hard because they had, had met the dogs. Um, I just want to also note that this is this is an important bill, but you know, we really need to address gun violence. And that is a it's a public health issue. And I hope um, our members will work with us to address gun violence. And we can see the effects of that, um, not only on our dogs, but on so many people that we love in our lives. So thank you, Officer Burns and, and Representative for bringing this bill forward. Right, thank you, Representative Schultz. And you know, just, I want to um, just say, when I first looked at the bill, I know Rep Representative Mecklen asked me to hear the bill. I was like, what, this is not a health bill. This is a veterinary bill. Well, it turns out the, veteran, the Board of Ver Veterinary Medicine is considered one of the health related boards. So that just shows you that we don't get these kind of bills very often. And what the bill actually does is simply makes an exception uh, for EMTs treating a, a canine, um, makes an exception so they're not violating the statute about what veterinary practice is. So that's, uh, am I explaining that right, Representative Mecklen? That's kind of what the bill actually does. And um, the question I would have, I'm really glad to hear Representative Hewitt say that these organizations are in favor because um, I guess the question I would have is, is whether there's anything about the licensing of these other professionals that would stop them from treating a canine within their scope. So, or maybe treating the canine is just something that they're doing that doesn't touch their scope at all. I, I'm not sure how that works. So the bill itself 
is great, fine, and I just wonder if it goes far enough to solve the whole problem. Um, Representative Mecklen, can you can you address that, or maybe I don't know. Representative Hewitt has expertise here too, but uh, Representative uh, Mecklen, Chair Leeley, Chair Leeley, um, I, I will say that this this language was very narrowly um, confined to if the dog, the canine dog, is injured in the line of duty solely in that instance so like you just saw uh joey and chase um if they're at home playing frisbee and the dog breaks his leg that's a whole different story but if it's injured in the line of duty anybody with medical training with all the different classifications they have whether it's vmt or paramedic whatever all they have a bunch of acronyms um there was a list of them two years ago that was so long to read and i, I quite frankly didn't understand them all but they would not be subject to a gross misdemeanor for, for rendering aid and, and, and you know, trying to, to, to save that animal to just to get it to the proper place. And, and as Joey testified, um, sometimes this stuff happens, you know, after hours and, you know, a, vet, a vet's not open. So there's calls that got to be made if it's, if it's really far. And, and there's a lot of things that take place rapidly. And, you know, anybody that has had that kind of train knows number one, stop the bleeding, right? Don't let them bleed out. Um, and I don't know that it really is that much difference between two legged friends or four legged friends or 40 friends because stopping the bleeding is number one, just stop the trauma uh, on the local part. But, but the fact that it's a gross misdemeanor that, that they can't even do this without, you know, potential um, getting in trouble is, is kind of lacks common sense. I mean, I, I, Joey didn't speak to it, but, um, you know, the amount of money that the Hibbing Police Department spent just in, in buying the dog, training the dog, training Joey, all of it combined, and this is not abnormal, um, you know, this stuff can run north of six figures. And, 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 okay, money is one thing, but also we have our four-legged furry friends. The AKC is behind this thing 100%. Um, and, and many other groups, uh, as Representative Hewitt mentioned, but there, there's other ones as well that are totally on board with this. And I, and I, I think this should be a pretty nonpartisan thing. Um, you know, who wants to see a dog like just suffer? I, 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 God well, Representative Mecklen, right. And honestly, if it was a partisan bill, we probably wouldn't be hearing it. So well, this is not, no, I'm not criticizing the bill. I'm just kind of asking a question about how the actual bill works because what the bill does is it allows, right, it allows somebody to give aid to the canine and not be violating the Veterinary Practice Act. So you're not, you know, I think that the barrier here is right now under current law, they'd probably be practicing veterinary medicine without a license and that's where they'd get into trouble. So the bill removes that barrier. My question was, whether there is still any barrier for the professional under their own licensing. And I'm assuming Madam there Chair. isn't. Representative yeah. Hewitt. Yeah, Madam Chair, I think medics and EMTs are trained to stay within their scope. So we're not talking to administer drugs or go beyond the scope of what they know in a human patient, but they can definitely do what we call basic trauma life support on the animal. And that would be enough to hold them over. And I think as this evolves, um, definitely in my time in the legislature, I'll look at what other things we can do with the training that's coming out. Um, but I think this will get us past this start point to allow them to at least treat the animal. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you, Representative Hewitt, for that extra bit of information. And no, we're happy to hear the bill. We're happy to remove the barrier that exists because it doesn't make a lot of sense, as has been very well explained by Officer Burns and by Representative Mecklen. So thank you very much. Representative Mecklen, do you want to make a quick closing comment and then we'll lay the bill over? Um, you know, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for uh, giving the opportunity and uh, thank you to the testifier, uh, Officer Joey Burns from the Hibbing Police Department. Um, thank you for the bipartisan support on this, that those that have co-authored it. I, I think this is a really important thing and let's see this move forward. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Representative Mecklen, and thank you very much, Officer Burns and Chase. And with that, we will lay the bill over for possible inclusion. Uh, House File 568. Thank you. Okay, now, um, 
All right. So it's, it's so much fun to have a dog come to committee. It really is even virtually, I must say. Okay. Um, we're going to now, we still don't have Representative Marquardt with us quite yet. So we're going to take up House File 1559, which is Representative Rasmussen's bill. And since Representative Rasmussen is not on our committee, the, the chair will move House File 1559 to be laid over for possible inclusion in the, in the uh, finance bill. And uh, Representative Rasmussen, welcome, and please go ahead and present your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to present House File 1559 today. This bill was brought to me by the Department of Human Services and the Minnesota Department of Health as a critical update to Minnesota's Safe Place for Newborns law. This bill has both agencies' full support, and I very much appreciate their hard work on this important issue. Enacted originally in 2000, the Safe Place for Newborns law allows a mother to safely and anonymously leave her unharmed newborn within seven days of birth in a medical facility or to dial 911 to dispatch an ambulance for relinquishment. Medical staff will give shelter, health care, and aid to the newborn until transferred to the care of human services. This law is designed to help a mother protect her child when facing extraordinarily challenging circumstances. Simply put, this law saves lives and was passed in response to tragedies involving abandoned infants. I'm here today with House File 1559 to address a few serious problems in Minnesota's Safe Place for Newborns law. Currently, the law does not allow a mother to give birth in a hospital setting and use the Safe Place protections. Once a mother gives birth in a medical setting, anonymity cannot be maintained under our current law. DHS and MDH fear that this oversight discourages mothers from delivering babies safely in a medical setting, leaving them to deliver potentially alone at home or in another non-medical setting. This bill continues the anonymity protection provided in safe place statutes by creating a process delinking the mother's identity from her newborn through birth records in those situations where a mother relinquishes her infant in a medical facility after giving birth. In addition, this bill also addresses important equity issues facing Native American infants who are afforded protections under the Indian Child Welfare Act and the Minnesota Indian Family Preservation Act. Currently, the law does not call for asking the mother if the newborn may have lineage to an Indian tribe and if known the name of the tribe. This bill explicitly allows safe places to ask for this information and report to DHS, helping to ensure Native American infants are given the protections and rights they deserve. Madam Chair, I have no testifiers today, but staff members from DHS and MDH are available to answer questions as needed. All right, thank you, Representative Rasmussen, appreciate that. And there is one testifier on the bill, Gregory Luce, welcome, and please uh, introduce yourself for the record and go ahead and give us your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I, I almost ran in and got my cat um, <laughs> because it's hard to follow up a, a committee presentation with a, a canine that you got to, got to see. But uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak in, in what I call partial opposition to House File 1559. Uh, my name is Gregory Luce. I'm an attorney and the founder of Adopt Your Rights Law Center where I represent Minnesota adopted people as well as adoptees across the country on issues involving identity, birth records, and US citizenship. I'm a longtime Minnesota resident and currently live in Minneapolis with my spouse and two kids. I'm also an adoptee. My submitted testimony outlines very specific objections to House File 1559. And those objections relate solely to how the birth records of abandoned infants as well as adopted people generally are treated under this law and by the state of Minnesota. Specifically, I'm calling attention to the treatment of those records 18 years after the birth, when the child who is abandoned and most likely adopted is then an adult. I want to be careful to say that I take no general position on the merits of the underlying law. That is, I am not opposing Minnesota's Safe Place Newborn Law. I fully understand the purposes of such a law and do not have comments on, on whether those purposes are being realized. My specific objection relates to how birth records are treated under the proposed bill. As I outlined in my written testimony, the birth record related to a legally abandoned child is treated as confidential data under the Minnesota Data Practices Act. In addition, if the child is born in a hospital, 
and the birth is registered as a vital record by the hospital, the bill requires that the original birth record be replaced by a replacement birth record. The prior birth record is then permanently sealed no matter the age of the person whose birth is recorded. This means the, the record, no matter what happens to the child, will remain permanently unavailable to the subject of the record. And this applies even when that child, as most do, become adults. I remind this body and others that the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Children states unequivocally that the child shall be registered immediately after birth and shall have the right from birth to a name, the right acqu to acquire nationality, and as far as possible, the right to know and be cared for by his or her parents. A right to know who your parents are. It's enshrined by the Convention on the Rights of Children. That is what is at stake here, though Minnesota already compromises that right permanently not even allowing the release of a birth record when the child is an adult. This bill does the same. Moreover, permanent sealed records provisions like in today's law is impractical, unrealistic, and leads to the state being complicit in deceptive practices involved in the birth records of abandoned and adopted infants. It is impractical and unrealistic because simple DNA testing as an adult, or even as a young adult, will ultimately lead to the identification of large numbers of biological relatives, including ultimately the biological parents, such as a father who likely knows nothing of the birth. That is scientific reality. And it's a reality this body needs to deal with sooner than later. It's also a reality that makes the anonymity of a person's birth an impossible promise. Worse, it reveals a deceptive promise of anonymity to mothers who feel compelled to use the safe haven law for their child's legal abandonment, believing that there are no alternatives. I know this bill's purpose is about the protection of vulnerable children and providing for women who feel they have no viable option to care for a child. But once that purpose is completed and the child is in the protection of the state or a caretaker, you must acknowledge and recognize the identity rights of that child when he or she is an adult. This bill's provision for permanent sealing of a person's own birth record hides the truth, upends heritage, and sets everyone up for what could be a devastating surprise later in life. Adoptive parents or legal guardians or caretakers have no legal obligation to inform their children later of an adoption or the origins of the child's birth. Replacement birth records created through section 144.218, which is being amended in this bill, do not indicate anywhere that an adoption or prior relinquishment occurred. Instead, because replacement records are indistinguishable from original birth records, replacement birth records state unequivocally that the child was literally born to the adoptive parents. As I said in my written testimony, today I currently represent an adoptee who learned for the first time last year that he was adopted. He is 35 years old. He now calls himself adopted, but he also appends to that life status, a term we all use in such circumstances, late discovery adoptee. The state's current sealing of birth records and making them unavailable to adult adopted people facilitates the fiction of as if born to adoptive parents. H file 1559 as amended does the same. Because these provisions are impractical, unrealistic, and continue to put the state into position of actively deceiving adopted people and people abandoned as infants, I request that you amend the provision by adding the language included in my written submission. And I'm open to questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. We do have questions from members. I'm not sure to whom the questions will be directed, but we do. Uh, Representative Breyer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a question for the author. Um, hello, Representative Rasmussen. Um, my question is about this um, birth certificate language. Um, my understanding, or I guess my question is, did you make any changes or is this consistent with how the existing law is set up for uh, babies who are, um, you know, come to this program, not through a hospital or with this, you know, is that a change? Representative Rasmussen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Representative Ryer, for the question. I might uh, try to answer your question in addition to uh, kind of responding to uh, Mr. Luce's testimony, because I think they're, they're combined. Um, you know, I, I appreciate uh, Mr. Luce's testimony today and sharing his concerns that he has with Minnesota's adoption laws. I believe that laws re regarding original birth record access for adoptees is an important policy debate to have. Um, however, I do not think that House File 1559 is the right vehicle for that broader debate. Um, Mr. Luce's recommended changes uh, to the bill before the committee today would grant mothers under safe place anonymity protection, uh, actually less anonymity protection than afforded to mothers 
under more traditional adoptions in Minnesota's current law. Uh, one of the central tenets of the safe place laws in Minnesota and nationwide is maintaining the mother's anonymity uh, and eliminating the anonymity requirements could result in a mother being afraid to use the law, which is designed to protect children from abandonment in unsafe locations. Uh, Minnesota only has a handful of safe place infants each year, but each represent a child who would be at risk of a tragic outcome without the law. And Representative Ryer, specifically to your question, um, you know, what this law does is, um, is essentially allow a process, if a mother gives birth in a medical setting, there's a birth, there's a birth certificate that would have her name on it, and it allows uh, the Office of Vital Records through MDH to replace that with a record that still records uh, a vital information on the birth of the child, but protects the mother's anonymity. Uh, and actually under, you know, it's my understanding, I'm not an expert on broader adoption law and DHS can dive into that, but there's actually anonymity protections um, under just normal adoption in Minnesota's law. And I think that's a policy debate we could have, but I don't think this bill is the right vehicle for it. Representative Ryer, any follow-up? Um, Madam Chair, just a comment that uh, my mom was adopted, and so I have lived the uh, kind of the knowing when not knowing and finding things out. So I appreciate uh, both the perspective of the testifier and the intent of the uh, the bill. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Representative Ryer. Representative Keel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just uh, had a little food for thought. Uh, tell you a little story, make it really short. Uh, 31 years ago, um, uh, our youngest was born, and right before he was born, there was an infant found wrapped up in a, in a rug at the campus of the University of Minnesota in a pickup. Um, someone close to us adopted or didn't adopt her, but became her foster parents. They never knew when she was born. The doctors had a guess, and um, there is no history. And I often wonder where that little girl went to or she survived and, and uh, pretty amazing because it was October and in Northwestern Minnesota, October is not nice. Um, uh, I did see her, she was four or five and she's a little redhead and a beautiful child and, and was doing thriving, was adopted out. But I often wonder, uh, with the, we didn't have DNA then. So I would think there's no information. And so I guess my comment is um, by Representative Jordan, by having that child able to be in a hospital, there might be more information for that child eventually um, because someone's asking questions and, um, and still giving the mother anonymity should she want it or direction should she need it. Or maybe she wants to keep the child but is really stuck, does not know what to do, and, and authorities can help that, that young lady out. Um, I do agree that it's kind of problematic that the father doesn't know, um, and that we're assuming that, you know, we don't know that. So um, I appreciate this issue, and Representative Jordan, I certainly support this. Um, I think this is a wonderful opportunity for people that are finding themselves in a position they just don't know how to handle it. And um, Mr. Lutz, Lutz um, it's probably a conversation we should have somewhere along the route that that is um, that addresses that heritage. It's important as health, and even more so when people want to know where they've come from and and the situation. But it it is a challenging issue. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, thank you, Representative Keel. And I have a question for Mr. Lewis. I see he has his hand up, and we don't normally allow testifiers to. <laughs> Yeah. you know, ask a question or, you know, but I will ask you a question and maybe you then can respond to it. Um, so then we heard your concerns and I, frankly, I haven't had a chance to read your written uh, statement, but I will certainly do that. Um, so uh, is the anonymity being offered to the mother in this bill uh, more extensive, just to be clear in case I didn't understand this, because this, let's face it, you know, this is not an area that well, I don't know, have a lot of a lot of expertise in this area, and probably a lot of members don't. But is this something that is being uh, this anonymity being offered to the mother in this case in this bill more extensive than what a mother would get already in our law? That's kind of the first piece. And is there a way? Uh, you you mentioned something about a, 
a way that you thought the bill could be amended to make it, you know, more uh, in line? Well, I understood what Representative Rasmussen was saying that there's, we don't want to use this bill to fix the law that we have now. And I do know that we have had some discussion about needing to fix our law. But is there a way to do something in this bill that makes it line up with current law if it indeed is going beyond current law in what you would consider the wrong direction? Mr. Lewis. Thanks. You. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the question. I appreciate the comments from other members. And it wasn't my intent to sort of glom on to the bill to raise adoption issues. Um, it, this is an important issue of identity, and it applies really to those who are adopted, or, or in this case, it could be the child is never adopted, and that that would grow up with a, a birth certificate that's not uh, doesn't have the full facts of that birth. Um, it is I, it, it's a hard question to answer as to whether it's more expansive or less expansive than current adoption law. Um, there are a lot of um, it's, the adoption law around sealed records is in Minnesota is one of the most complex laws in the country. Um, it has so many different um, uh, parameters in it that it's really tough to figure out. If in this case, in a safe, I call it safe haven, it's the term I've seen all over the country, uh, in a safe haven um, relinquishment, uh, there is no adoption. Those adoption laws don't apply. And so in some ways, the anonymity is more expansive because there are no rights given to the child in that capacity. That there, you know, there is a, a large intermediary system within the adoption um, framework, um, however you like that or not, but that that exists in the adoption framework. It doesn't exist in this framework. Um, in addition, I think it makes it much more, com this bill makes it much more complicated for the child who grows up to be an adult. If there's an, a birth in a hospital under this provision, a birth record obviously is created. And then if the uh, safe haven law applies and the, the child is relinquished, a, a replacement record is then created. And if that child was then adopted, a, a second replacement of the replacement record is created. And so you've got kind of a vital records mess there for the child if, as an adult uh, wants to find out the origins of that birth. And so there is some complicating things here that I think that haven't been fully thought through, uh, especially when the child becomes an adult. And I wanted to mention just very quickly about this idea of anonymity. I think that anonymity applies quite strongly at the time of relinquishment. And it may apply fairly strongly to the first five, six, maybe even 10 years of that child's life. But at 18 years of age, that anonymity is, is essentially gone uh, under today's modern science. And that what happens in these cases when you try to hide the genetic information from the uh, child who's in an adult, it makes everything worse because you sign up to DNA registries and you get matches of maybe 30 or 40 people. It could be first cousin, second cousin, third cousins. Increasingly, it's half sisters and uncles and nieces. And you ask that question to all of these matches, do you know someone who relinquished a child in, in 1985 for adoption or abandon a child in 1985. And those relatives then ask their relatives who ask more relatives. And suddenly this promise of anonymity is blown completely apart. And I think this body needs to take that into account when we're making these promises of anonymity, which can't exist in the future when that person becomes an adult. So I appreciate All right. the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Luce. Uh, Representative Damon. Thank you, Madam Chair. And to Representative Rasmussen, thank you so much for bringing this bill forward. I think um, as we look at the issue as complex as it can be, and we know that um, women in this state are when they are facing a decision like this, how difficult that it truly is, that it comes with heartbreak, but yet a, a compassionate mother's heart as they're making this choice. Um, I just appreciate the fact that um, we are expanding the opportunity for those moms to make a decision to go into a medical facility to provide that extra layer of security. I think that is something that we can't lose sight of that is so incredibly important. So thank you for bringing that forward. Also um, to do with the fact that if there is um, lineage that would attach them to a Native American tribe. I think that is valuable and that will give that particular child that piece of their identity, which is important. Um, no actual question, but again, thank you, Representative Rasmussen for bringing this forward. 
All right, thank you, Representative Damoth. Uh, Representative Rasmussen, why don't we give you the final word on the bill and then we'll lay the bill over. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, for the opportunity to present House File 1559 and for your attention to this matter. Um, Madam Chair, members simply put, the aim of this bill is to protect the welfare of newborns in danger of abandonment and help preserve the health and future of mothers who find themselves in unimaginably challenging situations. Today, the safe place for newborns law does not apply if mothers give birth in a hospital. This needs to be fixed. I would ask members for their support of this bill. All right, thank you, Representative Rasmussen. So with that, House File 1559 is laid over for possible inclusion in the finance bill. Um, and then members, we have, uh, uh, we're waiting for Representative Marquardt to present his bill. And he is, we are doing, we are moving right along today. So he is, uh, was expecting to be here just a bit later. So we're gonna take a break, which, uh, you know, we'll probably, we probably could all use. And um, so we'll take a 15 minute recess and come back at, uh, let's say 3.05, because uh, which would give us actually 14 minutes now, 3.05. And we will hope to have Representative Marquardt at that time. So with that, members, we stand in recess. <laughs>